Okay, can you all see my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to the International Challenge on Compositional and Multimodal Perception. Uh, this is the live session. Um, so there is a bunch of other talks uh, that have been recorded and available online through our website. Um, and this workshop is organized uh, by Kazuki uh, from Panasonic, uh, Juan Carlos, Feifei, uh, Jingwei, and I from um, Stanford, Olga from Princeton, and Alec and uh, Yusuke from uh, Panasonic as well. So during this live session today, uh, we have two amazing speakers. We've got Kristen Graben and Dima Damen. Um, and the other talks, like I mentioned, will be available on our website. So for the schedule uh, for the live session today, uh, will be um, Kristen first and then Dima. And then finally, Juan Carlos will uh, deliver some closing remarks on the workshop. Okay, uh, so with that, let's uh, get started. Let me introduce um, our speakers. Okay, so our first speaker today, uh, uh, thank you, Kristen, for sharing your screen, um, is Kristen Grauman. Uh, she's a professor at the Department of Computer Science at uh, UT Austin, um, and also a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Uh, her research primarily focuses on uh, visual recognition and search. Um, and before uh, joining UT Austin, she received her PhD at MIT. And she has a number of uh, amazing fellowships uh, and awards, including uh, AAAI Fellow, she's a Sloan Fellow, uh, a Microsoft Research New Faculty Fellow, as well as an NSF Career and ONR Young Researcher Award uh, recipient. Um, and so with that, Kristen, uh, please take it away. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. All Thank right. You. Although we are seeing your presentation mode, your presenter notes mode. Maybe you need to swap uh, this. All right, let me see if I can fix that. All right, how does it look now? Perfect, thank you so much. Okay. Good, okay. all right. Well, hi everybody, um, really glad to be part of this workshop. And what I wanna do today is give you an overview of a bunch of our recent work in this space of audiovisual learning. And I'll talk about it as we see in the following in terms of spatial elements and semantic elements. So I'm kind of dividing the talk in terms of things that have to do with 3D environments and things that have to do with video. So let's motivate just the big picture uh, we know that what we see is important. We care about it a lot, but we also care about what we hear. <laughs> and what we hear is going to tell us quite a bit about the scene that really, of course, can complement what we could see alone. So there's lots of scope and a lot of great work going on in our field for trying to learn about what we see by also listening. Places this comes up, well, material properties, the dish is clattering, it's a signal. Object identity, the cat meows, we know what it is. Emotion, as that example just showed. Um, but also dynamic sources, so the phone's ringing somewhere, we hear it, sometimes even before we can see it. There's a broader set of spatial cues that come from audio. So we might know it's a car by the way it sounds, but we also know where it is by where that sound's coming from. Or as my talk will show today, some elements of the geometry of the space are revealed by what we hear. And finally, we learn about the composition of an entire scene because it's both a distribution of objects, but also a distribution of their sounds and interactions. So in this talk, there's these two parts I want to share, um, as I mentioned in the intro. So first, I'm going to talk about audio as a spatial signal, and that'll be in 3D environments. And then I'll talk about audio as a semantic signal. And so we'll jump right in thinking of audio as a spatial signal. And here I want to um, talk about this new work on audiovisual navigation, as well as a new AV simulation platform that we've developed called Sound Spaces. And all the people you see on this slide are involved in the projects I'm about to show, um, both from UT Austin as well as Facebook AI and Facebook Reality Labs. 
So let me motivate, set the stage here. We're talking about a navigation problem, and you may have seen there's a lot of exciting work happening in this field um, of visual navigation. And this is where we have an unmapped environment, haven't been there before, and yet we want to be able to have agents that can intelligently move within this environment to answer questions, to get to a certain destination. And to do it intelligently, they need to have some ability to look at the egocentric RGBD views, like this one, and make good decisions about where to go next. Okay, so think of yourself in an Airbnb. You haven't been there, but if someone said, where will I find the toaster? You're going to choose where to move next in this scene. And so through a series of new contributions, some of them I'm highlighting at the bottom of this slide, researchers have shown how even for an unmapped space, we can both pick up that map through agents that explore intelligently, as well as do navigation to specific targets. And so, for example, seeing only the video on the left, the agent would start building a map like the one on the right, and meanwhile have good context about where to go in order to solve one of these navigation tasks. Now, this has been very exciting and a great place um, for new work. Now, one salient thing, however, that limits them is that these are silent environments and these are deaf agents. Okay, they can see, but they can't hear anything. And so what I want to show in this first uh, part of our work is how we can change this and let our agents hear, and then what that might open in terms of the research problems surrounding navigation or more generally embodied AI. So the idea is to first address audiovisual navigation. So let's just think about what would an agent in a 3D environment be able to do if it can both see and hear. Okay, so sound informs the navigating agent about a target location. So if that phone is ringing upstairs, where is it? Where do I hear it coming from? Also safety. Maybe there are certain places my agent shouldn't go because of what it hears coming from different places. Very interesting, it also will, the sound will also give us semantics. So I hear the water running from a certain place, even behind a closed door. That tells me something about the room inside. And finally, geometry and materials. At the very low level, the sound we hear is a function of uh, what's around us and what's it made of. And we can start to latch on to those signals in a way that augments what we can see. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a couple of these and what follows. And we'll start by looking at that target location question. And here's where we specifically want to do AV navigation, audiovisual navigation. So the phone is ringing somewhere, and my agent needs to learn a policy for how to get to it efficiently. Keeping in mind that this environment is unmapped, so it's come into this new Airbnb and it's trying to find this ringing phone. And what I'm showing on the right is a hint of why this will be a good task to bring in our audio. Well, certainly we need to hear the phone if we're not inside the room that has it in order to find it. Furthermore, if we can hear it, we'll have a good signal about places to go, even when we're not near. So what you're looking at on the right is the, a heat map showing the pressure field for this sound. And look, notice how it's kind of bleeding out of these doorways from the left and the top rooms, indicating where we might travel to find this uh, sounding object. All right, so this is all motivation, why we want to do it, the task we want to do. Now to tackle it, before we get to, say, the robot in the wild, we want to be able to train these agents in simulation. And so building on the great efforts that have been happening lately in building photorealistic simulations like Habitat, Thor and others, we're going to inject sound into these environments. And for this, we introduce a platform we call Sound Spaces, which is an audio simulation platform built for um, visually realistic 3D environments, namely Matterport 3D and Replica. This is about 90, 100 different environments in, in the set. And it's also now acoustically realistic. So we've modeled the geometry, the materials, the possible source and receiver locations in these environments in order to generate binaural, meaning two ear, left and right ear sound in real time for these agents. And with the, the platform as we've developed it, you can do this for a waveform of your choice. So whatever sound it is you wish the agent to hear, it can hear it in a realistic way within these environments. To do that, what we did is pre-compute what's called a room impulse response. These are transfer functions from the 3D environment accounting for its materials, geometry, to, um, at, to the agent accounting for its position and the position of the source in there. So for example, here, if we were to look at any possible receiver position shown in yellow of where the agent might be at a given time, 
then if I were to put a source waveform and convolve it with this room impulse response function um, in that environment, it'll propagate to let me hear properly the spatial sound at any of these points. Okay, so this sound basis stands alone as a way to give us now um, audio renderings with state-of-the-art um, algorithms for these realist, photorealistic environments, and it's compatible with the Habitat API. All right, so now we have a platform to generate these sounds. Let me talk about the task. So I'm going to play this video, and it's going to show you one of the Matterport environments. Uh, on the left is what an agent that we eventually build is going to see. So it's egocentric RGB view. And on the right is a top-down map of the full environment. Agent doesn't have this at the onset, but it will start to accumulate the map, as you'll see in these grayed out regions on the right as the agent moves. And now here's the task, where is my phone? Can you hear it faintly at first? Getting louder. Okay, and it's found it on the left there of that room. Now, pending how well you can hear through this video, but even if it's as well as possible, um, what you need to do to hear the spatial element of these sounds is to listen to the videos from our website with headphones, because you need that left and white, right waveform to meet your left and right ears in order to get the directionality. But here at least we can hopefully hear the intensity. Here's another sample. We could ask this agent to enter this new environment and find which smoke alarm is beeping. So here in this example, you'll hear two sounds, a piano playing, as well as the target, which is the alarm. Okay, so again, listening with headphones from the website, you'll certainly hear how the sound meets your ears, both getting louder as you get nearer the source, as well as the direction, like the piano passing you on the left. All right, so this is a very real world task, right? No one's told us where the target is, but we need an agent to be there and start finding it. And it's a smart agent if it gets to the source very quickly with a lot, a lot of backtracking or wandering around this environment. Okay, so what we did then is think about how to define this task precisely for AV navigation. So traditionally, uh, much work, at least recently, has gone into the so-called point goal task. And this is where, at the onset, the agent gets a vector telling it the displacement to where the goal is. It's still not trivial to solve because you need to navigate in a real world of obstacles to get to it, but you do know at least the strong directional signal of where the goal exists. In contrast, when we talk about the audio goal, what we want to be able to do is have the agent discover that sound, the target. So the right answer is to get yourself to wherever that sounding object is, um, but it won't be indicated to you, the agent, through this such a vector. Okay, so that's the audio goal task that we propose, and then you can combine these two, right? So you can have an agent that is given this displacement hint about where the thing is relative to the uh, first position, but you can also hear. And I'll show you results looking at both this augmented audio point goal as well as the core audio goal task. All right, so let's talk about then a first framework that we try to try and tackle this challenge. We're using reinforcement learning. We want to train up a policy that knows how to move the camera through the environment step by step in order to reach the goal. And our first framework looks at a, um, a basic reinforcement learning framework that takes now not just the visual or GPS sensing, but also the audio. And it looks like this. So on the left, you have the inputs. So you'll have it every time step an RGB or RGBD view. Then you'll have the sound. And here it's represented as a spectrogram for the left ear and a spectrogram for the right ear. And optionally, you'll have this GPS sensing, which would allow you to always have a pointer to the goal. Now we'll take all these inputs and we build this basic reinforcement learning loop with an actor critic um, policy that from which we can sample the next camera motion we want to take at every given time step. After moving, the environment comes back to us with a new set of views, a new set of sounds, and this will, will iterate. 
Now what we're rewarding for the agent for is good navigation. So big reward if you get to the target, incremental rewards as you get closer. That's during training. Uh, and then at the end, you have a policy that says, okay, given what I see now, this is where I should move next so that over my time horizon, I'll be getting quickly to the goal. Now keep in mind, um, this audio goal will drop that GPS sensor. And so when I talk about audio goal and the results, we're talking about an input that consists only of video and sound. All right, so then let's look at our first set of results. How does the audio help navigation? And first I want to show you the kind of baseline task, which is point goal. So for that very same RL framework, if we train the agent for point goal, um, here's an example where it does fail. So the source um, is down here, the yellow dot is the goal. The agent starts up here, and um, this agent chose to move around and kind of got stuck in this room rather than take what is the shortest path, which would be that pink um, line to the goal. Now, why did it get stuck? Well, there's a really strong signal from the GPS. You know, remember that displacement vector saying the goal is this way. And so without knowing the mapping of this environment yet, it wasted time kind of trying to get close to it down here. So rates of success in terms of a standard metric for navigation look like this, up to about 60% for the depth as the input. However, once we've augmented this with sound, then we have an audio point goal task. And notice that, kind of like my early figure suggested, where the sound was bleeding through the uh, doorway, this agent did learn to exit the room because of the sound bleeding out of there and then follow its way you know, reasonably close to the short path to get to the goal at the bottom. And correspondingly, the, the success rates are quite a bit higher by using this audio sensing together with the visual. Okay, so this was an, an example of where audio is coming in to help our navigation. And now I want to take it another step further, which is to consider, you know, how much we have to rely on this uh, heavy GPS sensing, right? So if you always have this pointer that's clean odometry towards the goal, um, well, you're going to get in trouble if that pointer starts getting corrupted. So on this chart, we're looking at what happens as you corrupt the GPS input more and more error as we move to the right, up to about 1.5 meters in error. And, as, um, and then how does that affect the success rate? So here you want these curves to be high, but naturally they're falling down as GPS gets noisier. But what's important, first of all, is that they're falling down harder for that point goal agent because it's heavily relying on this, whereas the sound for the, our audio point goal agent in blue is providing a good amount of that spatial sensing. And so it is much more robust to those failures in GPS. Furthermore, let's take away the GPS altogether. The audio goal agent does not have that GPS sensing or pointer to the goal. And yet, and you know, of course, this means it's immune to any change in quality of GPS. And yet, look at how the success rate stacks up. And I should say, you know, even if we add noise to the audio sensing, which is totally reasonable to expect as well, so say we have microphone noise at um, the level shown, then this will deteriorate performance, but it's relatively mild is what we found in these experiments so far compared to what's happening with this corrupted GPS. So this is exciting because it says that we are getting spatial sensing from the audio. It is augmenting what we see. Furthermore, it's headed towards replacing what we might otherwise assume in current methods from a strong GPS sensor. So how is it doing this? Well, we can take a peek at the features. So in that RL loop I showed you a few slides ago, there was a CNN on the spectrograms for left and right uh, ears. Now, if we do a simple visualization, here a TC projection down to two dimensions for what's learned for those audio features, we see that without being you know, explicitly told to code for these things, because the agent needs to achieve this navigation task, it has started to pull from the raw spectrograms encodings that do reveal on the left the distance to the goal and on the right the angle to the goal. So on the left, these, um, both these charts are color coded according to these actual properties. And what you see is that near points in our feature space have similar distance to goal, whether it's close in blue or far in red, or um, relatively good signal about the orientation, whether that's to the left or the, to the right of the agent. Okay, so the features are pulling what's needed to do that kind of spatial sensing. 
Okay, so we're able to use that sound. We're able to um, survive better with sound even when GPS drops entirely. And the next thing I need to test is what happens when the sounds are unfamiliar. So in every experiment we've ever done for this work, the environment is unfamiliar, meaning it's a test environment, we haven't seen it before, we're trying to navigate in it. But we've also tested with heard sounds and unheard sounds. So on the blue bars here on the left, this is where we've trained with phones ringing and now we test with phones ringing, but in new environments. These are the success rates. Now if you make that harder and you give the agent the ability to um, train with the various sounds and test with various sounds, you get the one in the middle, and finally, the hardest one in gray, these are success rates when we test on unheard sounds, so that are disjoint from those with which we trained. And so we do see that decline. However, keep in mind these charts start at point three. Um, so we're still having intelligent navigating agents, but it's getting harder to do um, with unfamiliar sounds. I think that as we go from here, where we trained with about 100 sounds, to say train with 1,000, 10,000, probably these gaps are going to get much smaller. Um, but you know, also when we add the um, the ability to have that point goal sensing, all of these are quite robust. So whether it's a heard sound or an unheard sound, the two modalities, well, three modalities, come together well to get this level of accuracy. Now those dashed lines there are the point goal baseline, and so. Um, in almost every case, when we have the audio point goal, we're exceeding the performance we could get without the sound. All right, so this is our first model, and now I'm going to talk about where it's weak. So um, we saw that there's this issue of you know, generalizing better to unheard sounds. We also see behavior like this sometimes, so where the agent might oscillate around an obstacle, you know, kind of be close, but not finding its way to success, or just taking a longer way around to get to it. And reasons you might see this behavior, given the model we first defined, is that it's myopic. So the actions it chooses are very step-by-step. -step, right? At every increment, the action space is, do I want to turn left, turn right, or go forward? And so there's a lack of some action, um, action abstraction. And furthermore, there's a simplistic memory. We were relying solely on a GRU within the model I just showed. So now let me talk a little bit about how we can improve these things. So in this next piece of work, we are introducing a model for AV navigation that relies on waypoints that are sensed from the visual and audio stream. So the waypoints are going to be like sub-goals that the agent sets for itself on its mission to find some further target. So in my cartoon here on the left, the agent might be in that top right room, the bedroom, and hear a phone ringing a few rooms away. And so it, rather than you know, think of actions at the level of left, right, go forward, it's going to set intermediate goals that say, let me first get to that doorway. OK, I'm out, and I see the open hall. Let me next get to the next doorway and into this target room. So that's the idea of a waypoint or a sub-goal. And the second key thing we introduce is a multimodal spatial memory, so a more grounded representation of what we see and hear with respect to the space as we move around it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about both these things um, next as I overview the approach. Okay, so we're going to keep with a deep reinforcement learning approach to solve this, um, but now let's augment it in those two ways, the memory that's multimodal and the ability to have modular planning and learning such that we can set these intermediate goals and act on them. So the input does have the depth or RGB and depth here shown. Um, from there, we're going to go to project down to the ground plane and, uh, and accumulate an occupancy map in 2D. Just think of this is the map saying where there's free space, where there's obstacles. And we'll keep building that as we go explicitly. But we also have the left and right ear sounds. And now we'll build this multimodal um, acoustic map. And this is simply going to look at the ground plane and record what its agent has heard at every time at every time as it moved around the space. So in other words, we'll know whether the space was free or occupied as we saw it, but also what we were hearing when we were there. And that'll be an explicit grounded record for the agent. Now we'll have this um, the module here enhanced to do not prediction of the next step we want to make, but prediction of the next goal we want to set. And so we're predicting what we call this audiovisual waypoint that will say within um, the space that we're continually mapping where should we set our goal next. 
And then a low-level planner will execute a shortest path to get to that waypoint. Okay, and then this loop continues just like before. So I just want to emphasize the key new ideas here um, are the ability to infer sub-goals from the policy. So this is trained such that reward is for setting for success in navigation. And that means the policy in the middle there, that setting a sub-goal is trained for navigation. And to our knowledge, whether you're talking about um, audio-visual waypoints or any other kind of sub-goal, this is new because it's setting sub-goals not by heuristics like the frontier or um, some shortest path learn based learning. It's instead learning to generate these sub-goals. And the second new thing is the acoustic memory. All right, so let me show you this thing in action. I'm going to again show you video as we have been doing before, egocentric view on the left, and the top-down map unknown to the agent but built as it goes. And there'll be some colors here. The yellow are going to be the sub goals the agent is setting for itself. And the purple dots that'll start accumulating here are going to be the acoustic memory representation. The brighter, stronger dots mean there was louder sound there. So here it goes. Looking for the phone. Sets a sub goal outside the door. Sets another sub goal, the yellow dot. Starting to get louder, another sub goal at the doorway to the next room is set. Right. And so now the agent has found that, that phone and notice how it did it by these kind of mod this modularity between planning intermediate waypoints and then recording what it's heard, which helps quite a bit in terms of avoiding backtracking and planning good um, paths and sub goals uh, to get there. All right, so now some results with this enhanced method that I just described. And here we're going to compare to two methods from the literature. So concurrent with our earlier work on um, audiovisual navigation where we introduced this task, there's work from Gann and colleagues shown on the left, um, a result shown here on the left, for audiovisual navigation. The approach kind of separates the audio and visual streams and predicts where the goal location is from the audio, using it like a beacon, and then does some path planning to, with the visual input to get there. Uh, in the middle, this is the resu um, result from our earlier method I showed you in this talk, and then this new method on the right. So what these paths are showing you is, first of all, on the left, it's very hard to predict from one onset where the final goal is, motivating, wanting to have this intermediate sub-goal setting. There's a whole lot of backtracking trying to get there. In the middle, I told you about what's wrong with the myopic actions in our earlier approach, and on the right, um, we're resolving this, at least you know, in a good number of cases, to make cleaner, shorter paths to get there. So I want to remind you that in every case here, none of the agents has a pointer to the goal. They do have clean odometry, however. All right, and then um, in terms of numbers, if we look at an array of metrics here, SPL is the first column. That's the shortest path um, or success rate for, for the shortest path to the distance, norm, normal, sorry, the success rate normalized by the inverse path length, SPL. You want this to be high. And what we're showing here are um, some more naive baselines on the top, the methods I just talked about, and then at the bottom, the new proposed method that has the benefit of waypoints as well as this acoustic memory. And it, it is doing the best across these, um, across these metrics and showing the potential for having these richer multimodal memories observed from both what we see, what we hear in a 3D environment. Okay. So, so far I've talked about navigation largely, and I talked about establishing a simulation that would allow us to do both audio and visual learning in a 3D environment. And I had hinted earlier about all these ways in which this will help us learn. In the next example from our work, I want to talk about the one that has to do with geometry and materials. Okay, so we were talking about targets, now let me talk about the geometry. And this is work um, done with the people you see here, led by Rohan Gao, and it appears at the main conference. This is our work on visual echoes. 
Okay, and this method is essentially a self-supervised feature learning approach that leverages echoes while learning such that we get a good image encoding when testing. So what is, what is it about? So what I've been showing so far, we were thinking of agents that um, hear what the environment serves up to them, right? They were active in the sense they could move, but they were passive in the sense that they would just hear the sounds of the environment. In Visual Echoes, we're going to flip this, and rather than um, some goal making a sound that we want to travel to, we're going to have the agent emit sound in this environment in order to learn. Okay, so if the agent emits a sound, it's going to hear some echoes back. And the key insight, or the key fact, is that because of the geometry of, spa of the space being affected, other way around, because of the um, sound that the agent received back is affected by the geometry of the space, we're going to get some spatial hints about the world around it that would be um, greater than what we'll do if we could only see the pixels. Okay, so that's where we're going. Um, now, this beauty or the value of echolocation and the ability to sense a 3D space from echoes is known by Hollywood as well. Um, so here I'll show you an excerpt. This is from the movie Daredevil, where there's a character who has lost his sight but can see the environment by listening to the reflections and reverberations when, it, when this person, this character, uh, strikes something in the scene here. So let's just take a look. Okay, so he struck that metal with the stick. The sounds resulted, and coming back to his encoding was a spatial map, probably a depth map, um, of the scene, right? And we know that animals do this. We know that people with visual impairments can do it very well. Um, so let's think about now echolocation as a learning source for our visual encoding. So here's the main idea. Motivated by what I was just saying, we want to be able to learn a image representation, one that's spatially enriched through echolocation. Once we learn such an encoding, we'll want to demonstrate it was good by trying to benefit several downstream tasks, and in particular tasks that are heavy on a need for spatial understanding. In fact, we did, we'll look at depth prediction, surface normal estimation, and visual navigation. And the key insight of this work is that we can have agents and video models that learn through some acoustic interaction with the physical world. So it's a form of self-supervision in that there's no um, human semantic labels going on here, um, but it's self-supervision through interaction, through changing and, and interacting with the environment, in particular by emitting these sounds. Okay. So the sound spaces environment I introduced early in the talk that we developed for the navigation is um, applicable to generate the kind of echoes we want to do here. So what does it mean? Well, in, before we'd have a source over here and the agent at some other position. Now just place the source and the agent at the same position. Then you have an agent that's making sound and then hearing the results. Okay, so I'll show you a video of in our sound spaces environment doing this. And you'll hear what are the sounds emitted, which is simply a frequency sweep through um, the frequency seeps so that we can, we'll hear um, a good rich um, reaction from the environment to all those different frequencies. And it's very short every time so that we're not overlapping the direct sound with the results of the echoes. So here you'll hear a bunch of chirps one after another. And you can, I think you can barely hear those chirps. You can also see some depth that I'm, we're just overlaying here to show that spatial representation that is going to be something we want to learn. Okay, so we can generate these echoes. And now what we do during training is sample pairs of egocentric views and the echoes that result. So now we're looking top down at a 3D environment. Say the agent was standing at the cyan X. Now, what we'll do at every such position for, every, for four different orientations is record those egocentric views, RGBD, RGB and depth, as well as the echo set come back. And those echoes here, again, it's two spectrograms, the top one for the left ear, the bottom one for the right ear. And now we'll do that for 
again, four different orientations. So here the camera was pointed this way, and this is what we saw and heard. But then if I were to stand at any other different orientation, um, at that same position, I would get a, a different set of views and echoes. Okay, so imagine collecting data like this, the, the echo responses anywhere in these environments. This is during training. Now, I said that the main idea here is a self-supervised feature learning approach, um, which I'm going to get to in just a moment. But in order to motivate why our approach may work, I first want to show a case study to see what kind of signal is embedded in the echoes themselves. So first question is, can we predict depth maps, depth maps from echoes? So it's a case study. We're going to take echoes as input, train a model to do depth prediction. Think of this as an echo-to-depth network. Of course, you could do, um, with state-of-the-art methods and vision, you could do monocular depth prediction from the RGB. And we'll want to know how those two compare. And certainly, you could put them both together. So we want to know, do the echoes have the signal to predict depth? And we want to know, if we augment the RGB with these echoes, will it improve depth estimation? So here are just a couple examples, two Im examples in two rows. Um, beside the image is the ground truth depth, and then it's followed by the depth you would get first if you used only RGB, second if you used the echoes only, and third if you used them both. And first of all, we can see that even using the echoes alone as input, we get a respectable depth map, right? It's showing the general shape of the scene based on what was heard by the agent who emitted these sounds in the environment. So this is encouraging. Furthermore, you can see differences between what you would infer in depth using only RGB as opposed to what you would infer in depth if you use RGB and the echoes together. For example, look at this top one where um, in the left RGB image, you see there's like a pillar or some shallow surface protruding from that back wall. This actually does throw off the RGB estimate. Notice that there, um, there's more break in that red far depth such that it feels like there's something much closer. It's fooled by that texture. Whereas on the right, using the echo was kind of smoothing that out, so it realizes that this is still a pretty far part of the scene. Those were two examples. Overall, when we test this uh, at scale, we see that, yes, there is signal about depth from echoes, and yes, if we integrated, if we were to integrate that with RGB, we'd be better off, okay, in terms of the quality of these depth estimates. Okay, so, so this means the data is good. It means the signal is there for spatial sensing. But now let me get to our main idea for the approach. So what we do is learn a visual representation based on a self-supervised objective, which wants to detect when the sound and the, um, and the RGB are consistent or congruent. And in particular, we'll have a stream looking at the RGB that learns what we call this visual echo net. And then we'll have a stream during training that looks at the echo responses. And it will, at training time, pair up the RGB with an echo that is either the congruent echo, meaning the echo that went with the RGB that we're sampling now, and what the agent would have heard looking right in that direction, or it'll be an echo response that's wrong or incongruent, meaning it's an echo that the agent would have heard, but it would have only heard it if it were turned 90 degrees to the right, or facing to the back, or facing 90 degrees to the left. OK, so remember, we had captured these in these four orientations. Now we're putting forth a test to say, if we process the RGB and the echo, then are we able to predict this orientation? So we ask the, these networks to be able to do this prediction of congruence or incongruence, and use this to now get a visual encoding that's enriched because of the echoes. So why, why would this be a good so-called pretext task to learn? Well, the idea is that if an agent is able to interpret the spatial layout from the visual information enough to report whether the echoes are congruent or incongruent, that means that it has picked up on the spatial cues that are given from the audio. Okay, so those enriched depth cues, like we saw a slide ago, would have to be learned well from the RGB alone in order to decide if these two go together or not. So that is the task for learning. And again, self-supervised, you're not annotating anything here. You're just interacting with the environment through the acoustics and the RGB views. 
And then finally, we'll take away the sound. So I've, it's important to emphasize this um, sound is used only during training. Okay, the agent is allowed to hear echoes and see all at once during training. And at test time, what we're really um, taking away from this learning is an image encoder. Okay, so the learn encoding now processes RGB images alone, no sound at test time, but it's benefited from this multimodal training. So just to illustrate this, now with this encoding for the image alone, we can do monocular depth estimation. Again, no echoes are coming in as input. That's all done. We're taking images here from the NYU data set. And for each of them, estimating the depth, our results are on the bottom. And using our visual echoes net encoding. Now, if you were to instead learn the depth prediction model from scratch, you get the row that's third here, labeled scratch. Um, and what's exciting here is not only are we learning something with sound and then leveraging it when we have no sound, but also we're showing a step of sim to real transfer because these echoes were experienced in a 3D environment with audio rendered simulation from our sound spaces tool. And the test data now is from real world photos taken in the NYU data set. Okay, so the depth is getting better. This is like the picture view. When we quantify this, we can show that yes, compared to just that scratch trained network, the visual echoes are helping give the spatial cues needed to do the task well. And um, not just for depth, but also surface normals and visual navigation. So the key takeaway from this result is that we can have pre-training for visually and spatially rich image encoders by leveraging these echoes during training. And in fact, it's competitive or in fact sometimes better than heavily supervised pre-training, like traditional ImageNet pre-training for which you would have semantic labels. OK, so, so far in the talk, I've really focused on audio as a spatial signal, audio in 3D environments. And now I want to transition for the remainder of our time looking at audio as a semantic signal. So not just about where things are and what the room's like because I can hear it, but also what are the objects like? What am I hearing? What are these things? OK, and there we're looking more explicitly at video. Okay, and so there's two things that I'll briefly review in our remaining time. And the first is our new approach for action recognition and untrimmed video. This is work that we presented this summer at CBPR. And the problem is this, we have untrimmed video and we want to recognize what's inside. Like what's the label for this video? It's untrimmed, it means you know the action, we don't know exactly where it takes place. Now one thing we observe is that there's a lot of redundancy. There's redundancy both across clips. So here, if we chop this video into one or 10 second clips one by one, some of them are really kind of telling us the same thing. Furthermore, there's redundancy within a clip. For any video clip you have, you know, things don't change so fast. And so there's a bit of redundancy. Well, this redundancy is a good thing because what we really need is more efficient activity recognition. But the ability to recognize in untrimmed video without exorbitant costs. And by the way, the, the typical thing to do today would be to do some kind of feature extraction for every clip. So maybe some 3D convolutional network that's pre-trained on kinetics, say, and then do classification on every one of those clips and then pull them over the entire video to give a response. This is expensive. It doesn't scale. It doesn't help you when you have millions or more examples of videos that you want to efficiently process. So this work is about, instead, looking to audio as a preview of the video and as a cheap preview, right? So audio is much more compact, much more lightweight. And so if we can make decisions about where to even process the visual through the audio, we can do things much more, more quickly. And as I'll show you um, next, if we can use the audio to reduce redundancy, even at the descriptor level of a single clip, we'll have very fast clip processing as well. So as I said, the standard would be take a 3D CNN, get a feature for every individual clip of this video, and then pull classification results. Here's our first idea. It is to replace that computation of the um, clip descriptor with what we call an image audio descriptor. So instead of that stack of frames for the clip, we're going to look at a single frame of the clip and the full audio of the clip. 
and that alone is going to allow us to approximate what that full 3D clip feature would be. Why? Because one frame tells a lot about what all the frames may look like. And furthermore, the audio gives a little bit of in information about the dynamics of that clip. Okay, so we can do this for all the clips in the video. And then the second part of our idea is to then learn which of them are skippable. Okay, so two ways to, to improve efficiency and accuracy, figure out which clips even need attention. And for each clip that we're processing, do so not by the full 3D conv on the clip, but based on a frame and the audio that goes with it. So let me just say a little bit more about those two steps. So as a clip level preview, our idea it has the form of distillation. So the teacher network is going to be that pre-trained um, video encoder for the clip level. So maybe 3D convolutional network trained to do kinetics label classification. Okay, so that's the more expensive thing. What we do is take that single frame and take its audio for the entire clip and now learn um, a model that will predict the same kind of classifications on that last output as we would have predicted if we did the full 3D conv on the clip. Okay, so this is a distillation from the expensive clip on the top to this frame and audio on the bottom. So at test time, you have just a single frame and the audio, and now you're predicting something that approximates what you would have gotten doing that more expensive feature. So that's the first key idea. And you know, this is general to the framework I'm about to complete in the next slide uh, there, but also more generally, anytime one might want to have a faster preview of individual video clips, you could use this image audio encoding. All right, so when we did this, we found that results are encouraging. So across three different data sets, Kinetics, UCF, ActivityNet, um, pay attention to this number over here. This is like the, the, you know, apples to apples, the best accuracy we'd get from our architecture if we use those full clip encodings. Um, so accuracy is good, but computation cost is bad. It's to the right. Whereas here, this is what we get with the model I just described with distillation. And this is showing, you know, accuracy is nearly as good, quite competitive, but um, efficiency is much stronger. Great, and um, the second part of this approach was to do a video level preview. So in addition to coding these clips efficiently, um, we'll also decide which of them we need to process for the for more to, to make the decision about the entire clip. And so the, this is a, um, an attention-based LSTM that will decide which of the clips for both the visual and the audio streams we ought to look at and listen to in order to do the video level label. You can think of this as selecting the key moments that define the action that we're seeing uh, in order to really improve accuracy, in fact, because we're able to ignore the clips that are not so informative. And when we put that part together with the part I had just described at the clip level, we're getting the results you see here. This one is for ActivityNet, where the speed up is quite good. So 15x speed up and even improving in accuracy. So about two points for accuracy compared to all these computing methods. And here we're doing all proper things to account for um, size of the networks and um, the, the networks used for the feature extraction, et cetera. So this was an encouraging result, much faster and still even a bit better in accuracy. And what do you get? What things did it select as useful moments? If you were to just uniformly sample clips, here are some the representative frames from those clips if you just were to do this naively. Whereas here are the kind of clips that our video audio preview is choosing instead. Here for a video of um, throwing discus. And here for one of rafting. Here again, the uniform baseline and what our method is choosing to pay attention to. All right, so the last part I was going to touch on is for co-separation of um, sounds and video. But for our time, I think I'll, I'll speed to the end because um, to make sure that we have time for any questions. Um, this is work that basically is trying to take video with overlapping sounds and learn how to pull out each sound in turn. Um, and if you're interested, I point you to our ICCV 2019 paper or ECCV 18. And just for fun, let me show you this example. Here's the kind of stuff we can do. You have a video with multiple objects, but you're hearing them both at once. We have a method that can learn from unlabeled multi-source videos 
how to separate each object in turn. So for example, here I'll play the original video and then I'll play what the algorithm would separate as to pay attention to one sound at a time. Here's the original. Here's the dog. Okay, so in closing, I've talked about audiovisual processing, both for spatial understanding, where I talked about the audio goal navigation challenge, as well as our sound spaces simulator. And I introduced an, uh, a deep RL method using waypoints and acoustic memory to solve the navigation task. And I talked about feature learning from this environment um, using the visual echoes approach. And at the tail end, I talked briefly about semantic understanding, our new work for being able to preview a video through sound in order to be fast about recognition and untrimmed video. And um, for time, I, I, I left us on the sound separation where we want to be able to pull out sounds from the video. And this is work with everyone um, you see here from Facebook AI, from Facebook Reality Labs, and UT Austin. So I will stop there and would be really glad to have any comments or questions. Great, thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, if, if the audience has any questions, feel free to use the QA feature to write down your questions. Uh, it looks like we have one question already. Um, the question is, how is, audio, how is audio, how has it been used to estimate spatial direction uh, from where the sound is coming from? I think this was a question from the first half of the talk. Yeah, right. So. You could, you can, you can train directly for this, or you can infer it even, infer analytically from the sound. What we're doing is two things. So one, in the navigation, um, the features that are learned from the sound will are, are trained exactly to solve the navigation task. And because knowing the orientation and, and distance to the goal is important for that task, that comes out of what the features are that get learned. But also perhaps other things such as you know. Um, the fact that there's a big couch or something else, you know, this very well can be encoded in there too. And we showed that a little bit with those T-SNE plots where that's kind of getting encoded. Um, the other place that the direction of the sound you would, again, implicitly learn is in the visual echoes and for a similar reason. But now the objective is the alignment of the echo and the RGB rather than a navigation task. So, so going off of that, I, I was wondering, you know, in the first half of your um, talk, uh, you talked about uh, the sound bleeding out from the doorway. Um, do you have environments where sound bleeds out from paths that can't necessarily be crossed by the agent? So things like windows, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So um, we'd have to look, you know, to say definitively, you know, how much does this happen? It's a function really of the environment, you know, if in Matterport, for example, could be windows, could also be, you know, if I had a kitchen dining room situation where there's like a, a ledge, but this is not, yeah, exactly that. So, um, so I think with something like a counter, you're going to, you, you do still hear enough for, uh, well, first of all, you can see where the free space or obstacle is, but you could still hear enough sound traveling through. Um, what would be the most likely place where hearing the sound is misleading? Um, other than such like a window or a pass through, um, I think it could be potentially from alteration by materials. So, you know, imagine like an object that's behind something, um, you know, very thick and sturdy versus something more flimsy, and then you're going to get different sounds, but perhaps as far as your navigability goes, they're equivalent, say. I could see this also happening. Uh, so going off of that again, um, in those tasks where the agents are asked to go find a goal and the goal is uh, specified by a particular sound, are those uh, goals instructed using um, language or other kinds of sound? So I, I guess I'm asking, are, are the agents told to go find the phone or are they told to go find this sound? Um, yeah. And if it is, so it sounds like it is the label. Um, yeah. So in that case, uh, sorry, go ahead. It's not yet, actually. So the, the way it is now, it's just um, trained to navigate to whatever's making the sound. So 
we tested it first with phones, you know, so you learn how to find phones, you hear the phone and you go. And then when we were trying to generalize, then we trained on a variety of sounds. And so it's learned to generalize, say, whatever I'm hearing, I need to go find it. Um, so it's not, at this, at this, in this system, it's not label-based and it's not language-based. It's just, I hear something, I'm going to go find it. Um, but you certainly could translate this to like an object nav kind of task where the object is told to you, say, okay, this is the one I want you to find. And, you know, among that sound or any other sound, you'd have to pick it out and go find it. So that's very interesting. Have you thought about experiments where um, there are multiple different sound cues happening at the same time uh, and, and the agent is asked to go find a specific source and so it needs to also make an association between uh, different kinds of objects and the kinds of sounds that they make as well as being able to disentangle uh, the different sources that it's hearing? Yeah, definitely. This is something we're actively working on um, and, you know, I think we'll get there. Um, right now, like in the published experiments, what we do have is things like adding distractor sounds. So you could have the sounding phone, but then there's other noise going on. Now, because we haven't specialized it to labels, it's just trained to find sounds. What we do is, you know, let it hear at the onset that there's something that it needs to go find and then start adding distractors as it's moving through, which means it can still learn in this way. But, but yeah, I think this is an important direction to bring the semantics of the sounds and the and you know think about bringing what I hinted at that separation sound separation together with the navigation task. Thank you. I, I have one last question. I don't want to monopolize uh, all, all of the QA, um, but at a, at a very high level, um, you talked about navigation as um, one important um, task that sort of combines both visual and audio audio signals. Are there other kinds of tasks that you think the community should be working on um, that combines these two sources of signals? Oh, well, yes, but, and, but there is also a lot of activity on those tests, you know. Um, I think in some ways, you know, it's really in some ways it's not, right? We're, the work going on today or in the last three years or so is also building on, you know, decades of work from multimodal processing and from multimedia. Um, so the, the availability and need for sound is not something our community discovered just recently, but, you know, there's a lot of exciting ways people are bringing this into, you know, modern methods and modern problems. And, you know, some that I touched on today, you know, navigation can be one, feature learning certainly is one by, you know, many groups ongoing, except sound source separation semantics and, you know, event, audio event detection and video. I do think there's quite a bit of work, you know, emerging and um, some of it shown in this workshop, of course, um, for these problems. And so um, it's very active area. I don't think there's a shortage of problems right now. Um, so we'll keep going. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, any last questions? Otherwise, um... We'll thank Kristen for her talk. Okay, okay then. Uh, thank you so much for coming by. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.